This is a brief PowerPoint presentation to review common building technologies as they relate to the structure and how they interact with building enclosures. The first thing to note is that there are four large categories of systems or components in buildings. Those are the actual structure, which is broken down into a superstructure, which is above grade, and the substructure below grade. And then we have the enclosure or the skin that wraps around the building and separates indoors from outdoors. And then we have the fabric and the services. The services are a very modern component of a building. Plumbing, electrical, elevators, communications, fire alarms, lots of modern buildings have a tremendous amount of money and some complexity tied up in their services. And then the fabric is a catch-all phrase that includes things like suspended ceilings, partitions, built-in millwork, things that don't do any of those other functions in the building. And the reason we break the building down into these components is mostly because they are built by different trades. They are almost always designed by different professionals. The structure, uh, superstructure would be done by structural engineer, Often there's even a specialist for the substructure, not always. Then we have the services, which are done by mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers. We have the enclosure, which is done by primarily the architect. That's the responsibility area, but often with some technical support from, say, a building enclosure specialist or building science engineer. And then we have the fabric, which may or may not be done by the architect. It can often be done by an interior designer, a completely separate profession. And this breakdown of professional responsibility and also trades and materials allows us to manage the complexity of modern buildings and allows us to optimize each of the systems. However, while this has been a very successful approach in modern buildings, it does enhance the need to have better communications between each of these categories. This presentation will be focusing on the superstructure primarily with the discussion of enclosure because they often came together. Another reason why we break down the buildings into the components like we do is because of a concept that Stuart Brand popularized in the 70s and 80s called shearing layers. These are the different parts of the building of fabric, services, structure, and enclosure, although he called them other things and added content and the site. And they each have, in typical buildings, a quite different lifespan. And so you like to be able to say, exchange the enclosure, upgrade and modify services like heating systems and so on, as they get better and wear out, and have flexibility to modify interior partitions and suspended feeling, ceilings over time. So this is uh, another reason why separating the components out in design and construction is useful. Although the practice of making buildings, constructing buildings, had long been separating out enclosure and structure when convenient, the famous architect Le Corbusier in 1914 presented the concept in the formal world of architecture that one could see great benefits to the designer and to the occupants if the structure and the enclosure were separated. He showed this in his original sketch of the Domino House, 1914, that really did show a whole bunch of the modern ideas. So you can see in this sketch here, the, it's purely the structure and the floor plate, and this allowed one to wrap it with a building enclosure that was entirely separate. And so this is sort of the first sort of um, example where we formally decoupled the two. But it did take quite a few more years be before decoupling structure and enclosure became commonplace. Generally, this was well after the Second World War. So the first part of this presentation is going to be the structure. And in older buildings in particular, the structure was often combined with the enclosure of the building. So we'll be looking at both structures that are part of the enclosure and structures that are separate in this part one. And of course, I'm going to mention some of the information in a historical context about what we used to do and end up with a lot of examples of what modern current practice would be seen as.
So uh, the most common structural system in the past for significant buildings, uh, large institutional, commercial, etc., was masonry. Uh, masonry is basically a mineral-based material, uh, sometimes natural stone, sometimes made of uh, natural materials like clay that are either dried uh, into things like adobe or uh, earth or fired to make brick. And then more recently, uh, it became common to use concrete masonry. So units are made out of cement, bonded fire, uh, sands, and so on. This is a very famous example of load-bearing masonry, the 2,000-year-old Roman Colosseum. It used what's called ashlar masonry. This is a stone that has been squared up, often made quite smooth, uh, and made a bit easier to lay up, often purely rectilinear. The opposite of this, the easier type of masonry, is to use the as-found stone with maybe a few edges knocked off, and this is typically called rubble masonry. Squared masonry, because of the extra effort, was always an indicator of uh, more value of the building, it was more expensive, and it is seen as better, uh, more fancy if you're a Roman. This is not just something that you find in say, ancient Rome or Greece, the Western civilization. This is an example from South America, uh, Saxon, it's called in Cusco, Peru. Uh, the way they cut the stones here was deliberate, apparently, to ensure that there were no ho long horizontal bedding planes because it's a high earthquake region. Uh, but of course, we know this in the Western tradition, both as simple rubble masonry shown on the right, which is somewhere in the 900s, uh, and on the left, we have a cathedral, this one in Bath, with a fan roof, all made out of you know carefully shaped masonry in the arches, etc. In the more <clears throat> modern, if I can call it that, say 16, 17, 1800s, we would use a lot of brick masonry because it was uh, not possible to find stone masonry everywhere you were building, and it was also difficult for people to find. Um, enough of that stone at a, an affordable cost. So it was always less expensive to make uh, masonry units yourself. And uh, when you did that, you could mortar them together with either uh, lime cements, uh, more recently Portland cements, uh, and in the past a lot of uh, earthen cement. So here's an example in Cambridge, Ontario of a rubble masonry. Um, and the walls in all of these masonry systems are, of course, the structure. And as such, they try and minimize the number of holes in that wall, because that would weaken the structure. Masonry is not very strong uh, in bending or in tension, and so you want to minimize the number of holes. And uh, this became a very common way of building buildings in our more recent few hundred years of history. The huge advantage, of course, is that the structure is also the exterior finish, the interior finish in many cases, although not always, and uh, also, of course, it provided some protection from wind and rain and definitely sun, uh, animals, impact, and even marauding bands of warriors or thieves and bandits. This is an example of a load-bearing cut stone masonry from the late 1800s in Toronto. It's a U of T building. And you'll notice that the number of window openings are kept modest and they tend to be more vertically oriented for a number of good building science regions, reasons such as better ventilation and daylighting. But it also happens to align well with uh, better structural performance because then you get load paths vertically that take advantage of masonry's incredible compressive strength. This is the School of Architecture building in Cambridge, and you can see the picture on the left. Uh, this was actually before we renovated it. Uh, picture on the right after. Again, very common form of construction all through Europe, Western Europe, and uh, North America, particularly Eastern North America, where we used masonry as the load-bearing element, often made of brick, because that was what was widely available, could be made. Um, and with punched windows, normally uh, taller than they are wide. 
another example, um, a bit later uh, version, 1915-1920 region in Pennsylvania. But uh, we continued to build this way for quite a while. It really started petering out after the Second World War and alternative methods were developed, always striving for lower cost and or better performance. This is at the University of Waterloo um, main campus and you can see the masonry on the outside is brick but what you can't see is inside is concrete masonry. So it's only a single layer of brick on the outside here followed by a single layer of concrete masonry for a total of about 12 inches. And so this is thinner than many of the old masonry walls uh, and it's also made of two different materials. And that, that thinness in two different materials created all kinds of problems in buildings like this that were built in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, sometimes resulting in the brick falling off into the street, uh, but many times, as in this building, requiring extensive repairs to the brick, as you can see in the top, the color is different because it's actually all been replaced. Uh, sometime about when the building was 35 years old, the brick had to be replaced um, because of freeze-thaw damage and because of water penetration to the inside. This is another example from the University of Waterloo campus uh, during a repair and, uh, and addition uh, being added to a building. And you can see the concrete masonry units on the interior with a relatively large gap. They didn't always have as large of a gap, but you can also see where the brick veneer header bricks, as they were called, that tied into the CMU are, are present. So it looks like concrete on the inside, looks like brick on the outside, and it was made in this uh, bonded together masonry wall approach. So this is a modern building being built with concrete masonry. Uh, larger units made of concrete, more affordable that way, although still considered relatively expensive. expensive it has the huge advantage that it is uh, quite impact resistant, fire resistant, good at dealing with sound, and able to handle a wide range of loads uh, that could be quite high if you want. Now, in this case, the building that we're looking at there uh, turned into a actual dormitory at the Wilbur Laurier University and in between the brick and the block is now uh, a number of other building enclosure layers. This is actually modeled on the perfect enclosure where the CMU on the inside is only the structure and the brick on the exterior is only the exterior finish and rain screen with uh, the control layers for water, air, vapor, thermal are sandwiched in between the two. But this provides a very durable, long-term performance uh, type system. Here's another example um, where you can see the masonry. Uh, this is for a, a retirement home. This is not an uncommon approach to institutional or long-term structures. They last a long time. They have uh, a lot of high-performance attributes provided the CMU is separated from the exterior finish by layers of uh, thermal and water and air control, which is not an uncommon situation today. This is an example where concrete and masonry are being used for the interior partitions only, not the exterior. And that's because of the, they want the fire and sound performance that uh, in this case, a hotel really benefits. The exterior skin is now non-load bearing and as you can see on the far left simply filled in with steel studs and windows and the masonry is used for its load bearing, fire and sound performance uh, predominantly. This is a, actually a relatively uh, high performance system in Waterloo being used for a combined residential commercial type of application in downtown uh, very good quality construction and uh, unfortunately the limits are you know somewhere in the four five six stories it starts to get too expensive because the masonry needs to be relatively highly reinforced the exterior wall here is not particularly uh, it's not load bearing in the sense it doesn't carry the wall and roof loads um, it sorry the yeah it carries the 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 floor loads do not get carried by the wall 
uh, it is the roof and, and uh, floor loads are being transferred into interior partition walls that carry the load to ground. The exterior is masonry here, just as a consistent and uh, relatively high performance enclosure system. Um, normally this would be used for a rental apartment so that you can get a good 30 years of maintenance free performance. It's uh, pretty uncommon for this to be used in a condominium tape building. Now in, your, in Europe, where there's a longer tradition of masonry, people have been, uh, you know, don't want to let go of the uh, the concept of load-bearing masonry, even though it is rather expensive and not necessarily high performance. So this is an example in southern Germany of about eight, ten years ago, uh, using masonry of clay to provide thermal performance. You can see there's a lot of large voids made in that block. You can see in the bottom right. Uh, and what you can't see is that the clay itself is filled with wood fiber during the forming process and during firing the wood fibers and particles burn off so that the brick itself is really porous. And that those two effects uh, provide a very uh, reasonable amount of thermal resistance. That said, the walls need to be something like 36 and a half centimeters thick, uh, which is like 14 inches or more so that uh, a reasonable R value can be provided. On the outside of this wall, of course, they would provide usually stucco or plaster, and on the inside they would also provide stucco or plaster. So this is an old school way of building. Uh, it is a getting to the limits of what it can do in terms of thermal performance, and it's rather expensive. But great fire resistance, sound resistance, moisture resistance, impact resistance, uh, is provided by this lo load-bearing masonry. The more common approach um, would be to use something like uh, CMU in North America if you wanted those fire and sound performance advantages. This is an example of a University of Waterloo res residence uh, and it is a masonry exterior wall with interior partitions made of steel studs. In this case the exterior masonry is carrying the floor loads and the roof loads and the reason for the steel studs on the inside is not just to save costs as partition walls, but also to provide future flexibility in that it makes it quite easy to move walls around as needs change. Uh, that said, they definitely sacrifice sound isolation between suites by changing from CMU to steel studs on the inside. But you can see we have all options available. CMU is interior partitions and exterior. CMU as exterior partitions and enclosure but not interior and vice versa. This is a high performance retirement home again in, in Waterloo, different building. Uh, CMU is the, is the load bearing uh, part of the structure. It's also the exterior enclosure support. Uh, then there's air, water, vapor and thermal control provided by spray polyurethane foam and we have brick as a cladding on the outside. Definitely a high performance system that should perform well over the next uh, 30 to 60 years without much in the way of upgrades or maintenance other than of course the windows. So far I have discussed systems in which the walls hold up the floors. That is, the building superstructure and the building enclosure are integrated into one system. Many modern buildings use frames, either braced or moment frames, to provide the superstructure and then add a separate enclosure that does not trans participate in transferring gravity loads. Shear walls may also be part of the superstructure of modern buildings and these provide only some of the enclosure functions, rarely all of them. So we'll look at some examples. Concrete is a common material used to frame a superstructure. In such systems, concrete columns and beams collect and resist all loads. The so-called infill is the wall system that fills the large openings between the framing elements. This infill performs the function of the building enclosure and can be pretty much any type of enclosure. Originally, in buildings like the Empire State Building, the infill was stone or brick masonry, like older buildings of the time. But today, light gauge steel stud, concrete masonry units, or CMUs, precast panels, and glass and metal curtain walls are much more common. 
I will discuss concrete frames first, then concrete shear walls, and finally steel frames. But historically speaking, it was actually steel frames that were first used, reaching relatively modern levels of sophistication early in the years of the skyscraper booms of the cities of Chicago and New York City. So by the 1930s, uh, the steel frame was pretty well what it looks like today, with some tweaks and changes, whereas the concrete frame was only then just beginning as a technology. Well, here is an example of a steel stud infilling into a concrete frame. The, there's also going to be some obviously big chunks of windows in where the steel studs are absent in the lower floor as you can see. Concrete frame is usually economical when we have many repetitions. So that means that when they make the formwork to cast the concrete, it's rather expensive. If you're building six to 26 type stories, then that investment in building forms for the building is economical. And it competes uh, well in our area, in North America, widely with steel. Um, so the formwork you can see in place at the top, uh, com complete with uh, shielding there on the diagonals to stop things from falling out and also to provide uh, the ability to tarp it in the wintertime to keep the floor below it relatively warm while the concrete cures. Now, we sometimes use concrete in lower story buildings like two, three, four story buildings, but it's always more expensive than steel. The reason we would use it is because of the benefits that concrete frames provide, which is excellent fire resistance, uh, higher load bearing capacity, and lots of flexibility because the two-way slabs, as you can see in this building, allow you to put holes in it for floors and service penetrations uh, rather freely. The columns are relatively widely spaced, but they come implicit with their own fireproofing, as does the floor slab. And therefore, you don't have to have another cycle of floor uh, of fireproofing. That said, um, normally a three-story building will be significantly less expensive to be built with steel framing, with fireproofing added. And many people will uh, not want to pay for the benefits of sound and fire resistance that can be had implicitly in reinforced concrete. Now this is the Engineering 5 building under construction. Um, one of the benefits that you can see of the building is that it has a very regular structure and so formwork can be reused to try and make it a little bit more affordable. But university buildings tend to be very expensive anyways because of a whole bunch of uh, process related issues as opposed to uh, construction costs. Um, we're probably 50% to 100%, uh, meaning double, the cost on the, on the campus at U of W or U of Toronto versus a building built uh, literally 100 meters away because of the process. Uh, so because it's more expensive in terms of process, the premium for things like a concrete frame uh, are, are more modest on a percentage basis. And so for a long-term building, this is the kind of uh, investment many owners would make. Now you'll notice that the interior partitions are being formed in this building of steel studs. Uh, 40 to 50 years ago, those interior partitions would be made of non-load bearing concrete masonry units. Uh, in Europe, they would have been made of uh, brick, uh, clay brick type uh, interior partitions, non-load bearing, potentially terracotta, that kind of thing. But today it's very common to use steel stud except for, as you can notice in the bottom story of this building, um, high in, uh, impact, high noise, high fire risk, such as generator rooms, electrical switch gear rooms, places, uh, elevator uh, machine rooms, where we would often use masonry as a impact resistant, moisture resistant, high fire performance, sound resisting partition, and flexibility is not as important. Upper floors, you might want to move around the floors in the next 20 years, and the fire and sound resistance is less uh, critical. Now, it's not a big stretch to go from a concrete frame to a concrete wall. In, in many ways, the concrete wall is a lot like masonry in that the entire fabric of the concrete wall takes the load. And so we typically then punch holes in it for windows and not make the holes too large. Now, because concrete is strong, 
you can make uh, concrete walls even four inches thin can can uh, support a building that might be four stories, five stories high. But more usually we provide six to eight inch thick concrete walls to provide buildings that can, you know, raise from three to even 30 stories uh, can be supported with an eight inch wall. Taller buildings may either use slightly thicker walls as much as 10 inches or 12 inches, but more usually they just use more walls inside in the form of elevator cores and so on to provide the extra resistance required for very high buildings. Now, you can see here on the left, we have a building under construction. This is Scotia Plaza in Toronto, constructed almost 20 years ago. And uh, you'll see that the holes that penetrate that concrete yeah, maybe less than 50% of the entire enclosure area. If you've ever been inside the building, um, there's plenty of daylight with that type of openings, lots of views, and the simplicity of having an extruded building of concrete with only the windows blocked out in the formwork all the way up the building makes for some uh, rather efficient construction, both in terms of speed and time and resources in terms of labor time. Um, on the right-hand side, it's a building in Singapore, uh, this building ended up being pretty tall and the loads you can see that a concrete core being poured ahead of the exterior perimeter wall um, and uh, you also see the the, the formwork that uh, stops uh, any materials falling from the upper floors from actually uh, maybe hurting people on the down on the ground floor now in a lot of rather um, prosaic buildings, such as this uh, Waterloo apartment buildings, we will use concrete uh, as a whole wall just at the end walls, called, and they call them shear walls, uh, and sometimes only as partition walls, and then use infill on two sides. So this is, not a, this is a very common approach for residential buildings, and you'll have the, eleva the uh, elevator on the exterior or exterior stairwells. And that solid chunk of concrete means that you can actually span quite a height and resist the loads from inside. This is a modern building in a, built in a very old-fashioned way in that the exterior wall is all concrete, it's pierced, and unlike the Scotia Plaza and Singapore building I just demonstrated earlier, this building actually is insulated on the inside. This is uh, relatively common in, say, Florida, where there's a real need to resist uh, hurricane loadings and flying debris. But it's surprising to use it in this climate because the floor slabs uh, create thermal bridges at every floor line. And so there are, this is actually a rather poorly performing building system from a thermal point of view. But structurally, it's wonderful, and it can be reasonably economic to build. Another more recent innovation uh, in all concrete wall buildings are insulated concrete forms. This is where a lot of buildings in Waterloo have been recently built this way, where the formwork for the concrete is provided by two sheets of foam, in, uh, foam insulation, the inside and outside connected with plastic ties, and it forms a concrete, solid concrete reinforced wall and you can see the number of you know penetrations need to be kept to a, a modest amount again 40 50 percent and yet when that happens you end up with a rather high performance enclosure system which unlike the previous example has at least half of the insulation all over the outside all the way which is uh, closer to what building science would want it to be and here we uh, now finally get to steel frame buildings uh, steel frame are often the vertical columns are the steel framed. You might use uh, joists in the floors, as you can see in the bottom right, resting on I-beams for the major beams. And the, the diagonal uh, lateral resistance is provided from wind or earthquake is provided by either a concrete or CMU core or diagonals. This is a steel frame building uh, in Singapore again where they are using steel columns for the vertical loads and steel diagonals to, per, to resist lateral loads. Now you don't need those diagonals everywhere. As you can see, they've provided three bays with diagonals here and as the building curves around, there are more diagonals. Um, in more typical buildings, in this case, two-story building, 
uh, retail building, you can see the diagonal braces. You might see a diagonal brace um, once every 30 to 50 meters, uh, depending on the strength of the roof diaphragm or floor diaphragm that transmits lateral loads to those diagonals. Here's a, another close-up of a steel frame building. Uh, and these are this is a classic where steel frame is less expensive by a long shot. So uh, this is a one-story high bay building. Could be a warehouse or a big box store. Um, and the cost of forming up this in concrete would be really quite prohibitive. Uh, it would probably the structural cost could easily be twice as much as for the steel frame costs. So the steel here is, is definitely an economic winner. Um, because it's a one-story, the steel columns are brought in, bolted together, and you're done. No, no uh, formwork needed. And the formwork cannot be repaid over many different pores because you only have one floor. This is an example of a, of a low-rise steel frame. It uh, could be assembled very quickly. Um, there's I-beams, as you can see, to support the weight coming from the floors, which are hollow core precast concrete. And you can see the lines between the, each of the four-foot wide panels of precast. And hidden deep in the shadows in the middle of this building is a concrete core. And the concrete core resists all the lateral loads and all vertical loads are resisted by the steel columns here. Core. Steel frame structure. Uh, notice precast flooring on the main floors and open web steel joists on the roof. That's because roof loads tend to be uh, less than floor loads in office buildings and there's less of a concern about deflection, vibration, and noise transmission, all of which uh, are not a big issue at the roof, and so here they switch from precast to open web steel joists at the roof. The diagonal bracing you can see is rather slender, uh, that there's two bays of it, and uh, so it's probably not as structurally efficient, but um, the premium is small, and it allowed them to have relatively widely open spaces. And by the way, those diagonals came prefabricated from the steel shop, so they were just lifted off the truck, set on those foundations, and that had uh, significant uh, economies just by assembling everything beforehand. And that works for a building like this, which is relatively short. Steel frame, four-story, uh, office building, five-story office building, and this is in, in uh, Kitchener, and you can see the diagonal steel bracing on the one wall. It's replicated all the way down the building, but that's about all it takes for a modest-sized building like this to take lateral loads. And this is at the edge of where you might start considering uh, concrete, but uh, if you're at four or five stories, it's still going to be less expensive in most cases to be using a steel frame. But you might choose, it would be a less of a premium to go to concrete, uh, but it would still be a premium. Here we have um, another reason to use steel frame, which is lightweight. This is the engineering lecture hall at the University of Waterloo, and they're actually uh, putting a story on top of an existing building. The building was built relatively strong out of concrete uh, because it had to resist soil loads, and so the additional load of a, a steel frame like this was easily tolerated. And you can see hot rolled sections for verticals and diagonals and open web steel joists uh, carrying the roof loads. Classic three-story suburban office structure. Um, steel frame taking the vertical loads, precast cladding, and what you'll see here is that the, the diagonal is provided by interior relatively significant in size diagonals you'll see here to take the lateral loads. Um, the concrete core is made of concrete masonry units and where the plywood is is large doors for elevators and that's one reason why that concrete core wasn't able to take the lateral loads is that there were two the holes were too large in that elevator. Another example of a steel frame uh, building the diagonals pre-welded those panels were made to be 8 feet wide, 2.4 meters, precisely so that they could fit 
on a 45 foot long flatbed truck. They were fabricated in the shop and then uh, delivered directly to the site, lifted by crane, bolted at the base, and, and we're done, we're ready to go. Just attach all the other pieces. Now, they don't have to be rectangular. You can do other interesting things. Uh, the frame on the right is actually not providing much lateral resistance. It's just a, um, a frame for uh, architectural reasons. You're going to see the windows diagonally. Um, but the, the frame on the left is definitely a good um, lateral resisting frame. In some cases, we wish to create the same sort of effect as a pierced shear wall of concrete out of steel. And that's the case here in this building in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Seaport. And uh, you'll see how wide and deep the steel needs to be. And you also see the reinforcing at the joints so that uh, moments can be transferred. This is not a, a simple pin connection with lateral bracing elsewhere. This is a frame, a moment frame, that provides lateral bracing inherently. This tends to be expensive because of all the metal fabrication at those joints to weld everything together. The additional bolts required to get stiffness uh, that can transfer moments. And so this is uh, definitely done in certain conditions. Um, probably the most common building you can see that does this is First Canadian Place in downtown Toronto was built in this manner. Three-story high prefabricated sections they called trees of the columns and the moment resisting joints. This is a small building um, in, uh, but showing a rigid connection and this is literally for a building it's, it's only about uh, 10 meters wide. Um, so that's the kind of brace connection you would need to do if you wanted to transfer the moments from the vertical to the horizontal and provide lateral resistance. So that's something that is not uncommon in smaller scale buildings, buildings that are larger than a single family home, but smaller than uh, a large span structure or multi-story structure, is a steel frame building with an infilled wood frame enclosure. So this is an example uh, in Canada, but it's quite common in the Western United States as well, where we have a steel frame, uh, sometimes with X bracing, sometimes as in this case with knee bracing, moment frame corners, and then wood framing is added inside of or over top and around the steel frame to form the building enclosure. So far, we've just talked about the superstructure, the structural system and enclosure above grade. It's also critical that we understand that all of that rests on a substructure, sometimes a very simple one and sometimes quite an elaborate, complex and expensive one. So we have several different ways of supporting a building. Uh, we have footings, as they're called, uh, either isolated ones, column footings, or strip or wall footings. We also have piles, and then we have rafts uh, or mats or slabs, as they're called, which are basically a big plate on which we build the building. Historically, the way we started making footings, foundations, substructure, is we extended the walls downward into the soil. And often we would use posts of the frame above and simply insert those posts in a hole. But we very quickly discovered that, well, the ground is almost always softer than the wood pole, the masonry wall, the stones that we're placing on it. And therefore, to reduce the stress, stress defined as force divided by area, the obvious way to achieve this is to increase the area. That fundamentally is the solution that substructures provide. They increase the area of contact from the columns, frames, and walls of the superstructure to a large enough area that the subsoil below can support the stress. As you can see, there's multiple ways we can achieve that with a masonry wall. Those are some historic drawings from above. Most of the time, it was needed to expand the base of the wall to make it fatter. And this we called a footing. On the bottom right, you see a historic document about the size of the footing, and the width of the wall and rules of thumb used at the time, in this case, in London, England. Of course, now we've gotten much more sophisticated about calculating when and what kind of footing we need.
A completely separate issue it results when we need to excavate soil to create a below grade space. These are called basements or maybe crawl spaces if they're not big enough to walk in. And these spaces are actually quite complicated to make, especially in urban sites where we can't slope the ground to the bottom of our basement. I'm not going to talk much about this because the resulting structure is a lot like an above grade wall, but building them is actually quite a bit of a challenge. In this slide, one can see how deep a foundation might have to go is to make a large deep basement. The walls there are not actually foundation substructure. They're just temporary construction walls to keep the soil from collapsing in from the streets around it. As the excavators work and the drum trucks take the spoil, as it's called, the excess earth away, we need to hold the walls back. And what you can't see is that there's a bunch of cables that are being inserted into deep holes, often 30, 60 or more meters long that are drilled at an angle into the ground below. And that's what's holding back the walls. This allows the constructor to then build the foundation substructure needed without having the soils collapse on them. This is a view of the evolved building, which is actually makes more energy in a year than it consumes in Waterloo. Um, and we can see an early stage construction. It does not have a basement. It is barely a, a small trench to get below frost uh, level. And we see a combination of both strip walls and large uh, column footings that are being constructed right now. In the near picture near the bottom, you can see the reinforcing steel being placed in the hole in the soil before the concrete is being placed. On the left, you see the pier footings and the walls. So an example of a number of these different shallow foundations that are being installed and are quite common in smaller buildings. Here are some slides showing you on the left the formwork, very simple for a strip footing and the pouring of the concrete into those footings to make the strip footing. Whereas on the right you can see the resulting concrete and the formwork for that uh, strip footing being removed. This for a, a small building uh, much like a house or a strip mall in Waterloo Region. The small building's footing that we saw in the previous slide is now has a wall constructed on top of it, and that wall lifts the building up so that it is now above the grade around and makes sure that the loads get transferred below frost into stable soil, roughly 1.2 meters or 4 feet below grade. Pile foundations are a type of deep foundation that is used when the soil conditions are particularly poor, especially swampy kind of ground. You can make piles out of wood, concrete, steel, hollow tubes, all kinds of long slender items that can be put into the earth. One of the techniques of getting the pile into the ground is to pound it into the ground. This is called a driven pile and is shown here on the left hand side in the photograph for the Vancouver Convention Center. Now piles are often topped with a, what's called a pile cap, which looks a lot from above just like a footing, but instead of that footing being in placed on soil, it's placed on three typically, maybe five, six, seven, eight piles that are either drilled or pounded into the ground. On the left side, we see what is a hollow steel pile being drilled, which is called bored, into the earth. Sometimes those piles that are hollow steel pipes are subsequently filled with reinforced concrete, uh, or the pipe may even be removed while the concrete is still wet. So there's a bunch of techniques and technology that can be used to make the piles. As you can see, the stacked up pipes in the background of this photograph whether being used to be drilled into the earth. And in the near foreground, you can see a grouping of piles, maybe about eight or nine of them, that will subsequently be coated by a large pile cap and probably a pier. This slide shows you a couple images of bored and poured piles. In this technique, a hole is drilled 
and then they pour concrete into that hole, almost always with reinforcing steel to make it strong. Of course, if the soil is not very uh, solid, if it's kind of swampy, well then you need to put a case around the hole so it doesn't collapse before you pour the concrete. But in, in stiffer soils, you can often just drill the hole and then pour it. The picture shows uh, a unique situation where bored and poured uh, piles were, have been exposed on the coast of the Pacific Ocean near San Francisco, where the soil collapsed away the building has been left uh, and abandoned many years ago, but now we can actually see what the piles look like after they've been constructed. So that's the end of this short introduction to the superstructure, a little bit of substructure, and some of how the enclosure interacts with same, both from a historical point of view and developmental, as well as thinking forward to how we build things today. So in the next presentation, we'll look further into the choices and the evolution of the building enclosure.